Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. This is a plenary session, which is an extraordinary one for the European Union, an extraordinary because of the health situation, but not only because of that. One year ago, climate and democratic values were high on the Renew Europe agenda. We really pushed these points. We pushed the Commission and the Council to take these two subjects very seriously. And today we have the opportunity to see that these two con topics are becoming more concrete with the climate law on the one hand, which is on the plenary agenda for today, and also a resolution on the rule of law. And it's for this reason that I have beside me my colleague, Mikhail Simika, who is vice president of the group and who is our rapporteur on this resolution on the rule of law. And very probably Pascal Confin, the president of the MV committee, a member of our group who will be joining us to speak of the climate law a little later. But first of all, a couple of words on the European Council. We've just finished our exchange of views with Charles Michel on the Council agenda a few days ago. We spoke of the fact that we need a geopolitical Europe and a geopolitical Europe, not just a geopolitical commission, but a council which is geopolitical as well. But this presupposes that we construct this geopolitical Europe not th only through declarations, but through acts above all and through decisions. Acts and decisions, and which have to be effective. We've heard we had to wait for two months for sanctions on, for the Lukashenko regime in Belarus. And only at the end of two months, we now have sanctions. It's a good thing that the decision has finally been taken. But I hear some people saying, well, it shouldn't have been put on the list. We should have maintained open the communication channel. What, but what type of communication can you have with Mr. Lukashenko? He's clearly demonstrated to us how he communicates with the Kalashnikov in his hand. So Europe, to not be discredited and to remain credible, it needs, as I say, to be able to take decisions and to take decisions quickly and to be firm. So we spoke also in our exchange in the plenary of the fact that for Europe to be more effective on this decisions, we, are, we need not only motivation from member states to play their European role, and not just national interests, there also has to be a decision-making system, majority-based, a qualified majority rather than unanimity-based. Otherwise, the process will be very decision. On the issue of rule of law, this is a topic which for us is part of the entirety of the debate on budgetary aspects and the recovery plan. And it's a key element alongside own resources because own resources, rule of law and the money to be injected into the European economy are part of the same topic. We need to inject money into the European economy, but we also need to inject into our societies the rule of law and respect of European values, because without these values, we would be a mere distributor of funds. So we are asking for months and weeks now for the council to come with a negotiating position so that we can start discussing this rule of law mechanism, which we have been calling for. We want it to be linked to how European funds are spent. And the council has put it in its conclusions in looking at the recovery plan economic perspectives. But now the council has finally put on the table a negotiating position it's good that we have it, even if it is some distance away from the Parliament's position. At least we can kick off dialogue on the topic, but we have a long road to go down. We're ready to go down the path as quickly as possible. If we have a true uh, partner wishing to negotiate, the Council is keep, keeps a reference to values, but ensures that they are without potential effect. The Council doesn't want qualified majority, which we proposed. It's proposing just uh, just qualified majority. On the other hand, it multiplies 
artifices which would enable member states to block or to delay the procedure and it reduces the scope. Now we need a mechanism which is clear, which is not different from one member state to the other, which concerns all member states, the entire union, and for it to remain credible and applicable, we need clarity in its scope and in terms of how it's implemented. That's what the parliament is calling for. That's what the parliament is going to propose as well. So we're at a stage where this council proposal, it's good that it's there, that it exists, but it's not yet acceptable for the parliament. I'll have the opportunity to say this and to put this to the German presidency in the upcoming days. I'll be meeting the ambassador of Germany to the European Union with the minister to confirm what my colleagues and other group presidents have said. We are going to put on the plenary agenda the pers budgetary perspectives and the recovery plan when we have clarity on this mechanism and when we have a decision on this rule of law mechanism. On the climate law, debates are focusing on the figures. The figures are very important and Pascal Canfin, who's with us, he's NV committee chair of the European Parliament, will s talk to us about that shortly. But I would like to perhaps go beyond the figures and say that this climate law is important not just to have clear commitments on the part of the European Union on what is to be done over the coming years, but also to give a clear signal that the European economy needs to restructure to be brought in line with this reality. We cannot, we're not saying, and we don't want to destroy the economy, speaking about the environment, but if we don't change, the European economy will weaken because climate change is not neutral from the economic point of view. It is already causing damage. And if we don't change our economies, we risk falling behind and that will cost us a great deal. So it's a big societal project which will make us stronger, which will create jobs if we take it seriously. And if we translate this vision of good management, sound management of natural resources, of reducing carbon emissions, moving towards carbon neutrality, if we translate it into legislation, but also in all economic policies in Europe and in our be societal behavior as well. That's the objective of this very strong beginning of this climate law. And Pascal will say a few words to us about that shortly. We also today will be speaking about the council conclusions on the digital and on the strategy for European autonomy in this area. Without digital alongside the environment, environment, it won't be possible. And I would recall the European Parliament put up a special committee on digital and artificial intelligence, and we will be making proposals along those lines. And Europe really has the opportunity over the coming years to transform economies and European society and to put it on the right lines, the right path to bring it more in line with the reality that we are living through today, which requires quick decisions. Now, having said that, I'll hand over to Pascal and then afterwards to Mikal, who will talk about rule of law. But first, Pascal. Okay. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much uh, and good morning. Um, I'll try to briefly uh, introduce the, uh, the rule of law mechanism and the rule of law, uh, democracy and fundament fundamental rights mechanism, uh, which is a parliament's proposal currently in the plenary and will be voted uh, later today and tomorrow. And as uh, President Cholos has said, um, given the severe crisis that the European Union uh, finds itself in when it comes to uh, democratic and you know, other core values of our community, uh, it is absolutely urgent that, uh, that, we need, uh, that we need a monitoring mechanism that really works. 
the situation on the ground in, in a number of member states, obviously Poland and Hungary, is not getting better despite um, the, you know, the years of dialogue and Article 7 proceedings and infringements uh, and what have you, and we're still, uh, we're still not seeing any progress. This is why uh, our political group, Renew Europe, this is why the Parliament calls for a legally binding uh, monitoring mechanism uh, that will ensure the compliance of all 27 member states uh, with the values listed uh, in Article 2. Uh, this, I believe, is, is crucial also to make it uh, no longer a taboo uh, for member states to discuss the failings of democracy, rule of law and fundamental rights among each other, because this is uh, part of the problem that while in the European Union member states um, uh, are not squeamish to criticize each other for failing to meet uh, debt or deficit um, uh, reductions or for failing on economic reform, but when it comes to the rule of law, uh, you know, everybody is suddenly uh, suddenly silent. We want to change that. Now, of course, you, um, most of you know that the European Commission uh, has last week published uh, a rule of law report, uh, which we welcome, which is a step in the right direction, something that the Parliament uh, is calling for, has been calling for now for four years. But we believe, and with this proposal on the table, that the European Union can and uh, should do better. Crucially, uh, our proposal um, strengthens uh, the monitoring mechanism by, uh, by streamlining the various other uh, tools that the European Union has at, at its disposal when it comes to the rule of law, uh, brings them all under, on, under one roof, uh, and that, that includes a rule of law framework, that includes uh, the CVM potentially in the future, uh, and others, so there is more, uh, so there is more clarity uh, in, the, uh, in the area. Secondly, we want to, and this is crucial uh, in our proposal, enlarge the scope of the monitoring to include not just uh, you know, justice uh, and independence of, of the judiciary or just anti-corruption efforts, but to include democracy and fundamental rights in this annual monitoring as well. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, uh, what we need now um, is action. Uh, and monitoring is, is good, and the Commission's report was, was thorough, was well written, uh, but, there's, uh, but, but there's no action uh, to, be, to be had uh, as, uh, as a follow-up. And this, I think, is one of the weaknesses. This is why, in our proposal for, for the mechanism and rule of all democracy and fundamental rights, we, we make clear links between uh, the findings of, of this monitoring uh, and enforcement, uh, including a link with the uh, with the budgetary conditionality that, that President Cholos talked about, uh, or including link with, uh, with infringement with Article 7. It must be clear that when the monitoring uh, finds that there's a systemic failure, there's a clear consequence uh, that will flow from that, because monitoring alone will, will not bring back ju judicial independence in Poland or will not save free media in Hungary. We need, we need action at the moment, and this is what's lacking. Um, finally, I, I would, uh, would hope that if the Council and the Commission are really serious of, uh, about restoring the EU as a community of shared values. They will uh, begin immediately negotiations with the Parliament uh, on uh, how to strengthen the rule of law monitoring on the basis of our report. Uh, I should remind um, here that uh, the report contains a draft uh, proposal for an interinstitutional agreement which the Parliament or any institutions can propose. Uh, so we really hope that the other two institutions will take it seriously and uh, will uh, begin the negotiations. That's uh, for me for now, and obviously we're happy to answer any questions on this. Pascal. Okay. Uh, je peux le faire en français si j'ai bien. If I've understood correctly, I can speak French. So, good morning, everyone. The climate law is one of the key elements of the Green Deal. It's one of the cornerstones of uh, this project, and it's something that is going to be backed by a large majority from different uh, leanings in the European Parliament, because we have uh, the Greens and the EPP uh, in favor of the compromise. That's what we voted in plenary. But nonetheless, this, uh, there are issues that are still need to be discussed, and that would be the objectives for 2030. So if you have any questions on uh, any other aspects of the climate law, please do let me know. But I will mainly be talking about the objectives till 2030. So before 2050, we have 2030. The main objective is climate neutrality by 2050. Three years ago, 
three countries were in favor of having a carbon neutrality target by 2050 uh, and that was Sweden, Luxembourg and France. Now, today things have changed. Today all member states are in favor of this climate neutrality objective by 2050 across the EU. And 26 out of the 27 countries, because Poland is still against, they are in favor of something like this happening. So this is already very important. We're no longer talking about, uh, we're not no longer uh, discussing uh, the issue itself. Uh, three years ago, obviously this seemed impossible. So clearly we've made progress. But now we have this objective for 2050. And for us in the European Parliament, this is once again shared by the Greens and EPP. We should not just have an average uh, across the EU, but we should have objectives for each country. And this is something that is uh, specifically addressed to Poland, which is the only member state not in favor of the of the climate targets as such. Now, uh, the votes. Uh, we have different options. There are only three options that could possibly win. Firstly, what comes from the NV committee. This is something that that enjoyed a majority in NV committee, and that is 60%. This is a proposal that was uh, put forth by Renew, uh, mainly largely supported by Renew as well. So this is something that would set up the necessary ambition so that the heads of state and government that meet next week in the European Council constellation will ensure that the final landing zone at the end of trialogues, negotiations, discussions and council will be what we would like, that is at least 55. If the European Parliament does not send this uh, message that we want a more ambitious position than the starting point, then we have ended up with a weaker a position as compared to the starting point. Therefore, we support 60 because we think that this is the best compromise between what is politically possible. It's, it's going to be a very close vote, really. Sometimes we have five votes uh, ahead, five votes behind. So it's really going to come down to a couple of votes. But of course, let's see, tomorrow morning uh, we'll have the vote and that's when we'll actually know. So if 60 is not accepted, another possible majority option could be at least 55 gross. This is a large uh, position that has been supported uh, by the European Parliament since the beginning of this term in the resolution on the Green Deal, the resolution on COP25, uh, etc. So this is something that could uh, come up with a majority. If that uh, does not enjoy majority, which is unlikely, but nonetheless, then the third uh, uh, item that will be put to a vote is the commission position, and that is 55 net. So what is the difference between 55 gross and 55 net? Well, there we're talking about uh, two different points because uh, it's it's two different percentage points. It's uh, a 55 net is actually 53 gross. Uh, you can ask for the question that if you would like. So these are the three proposals. If we don't get the first one, we'll support the second. And if the second doesn't get a majority, we'll support the third. So what does this mean? This means in any case, we're going to send an ambitious message through the climate law. We have to remember that uh, when we're looking at the progress that we've made, the manifesto from the Greens in 2019 was at least 55. So this means that the minimum that the parliament will back will be the position that the Greens uh, supported uh, and the position that the parliament adopted a year and a half ago. So clearly things have moved uh, significantly over time. The uh, NGOs are asking a lot more. Gu is asking for a lot more. Maybe tomorrow they'll say 100%. But in any case, uh, things have changed significantly. And I'm very happy about that. And I think that we are not going to win the battle against climate change if everyone is not pulling at the same thread in their different regions. So the conclusion, if the vote uh, uh, is less than 60% for 2030, and if we do begin negotiations with council and are able to go through them quickly, 
Our objective in Renew is to conclude these negotiations before the 12th of December. Now, why are we talking about the 12th of December? Because that would be the fifth year anniversary of the Paris Agreement. Because there's going to be an event to celebrate the five year anniversary. And uh, the what uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, proposed in uh, November, well, if uh, Donald Trump is defeated in November, then Joe Biden will probably join the Paris Agreement once again. So this would be uh, quite a win in and of itself. So thus we can see that even 10 years on that we've made major progress and we would have the three big uh, worlds, the, the three largest emitters in the world, China, the US and the EU together working towards ambitious goals in terms of uh, climate change. So this is the main message and I do hope that we will be victorious this evening. Thank you. Voilà. Merci, à, merci, merci à tous. Thank you very much. Uh, I have some questions. I have uh, one question on the MFF for President Chilos, and then um, the EFP management. So you talked about uh, rule of law. So how are the own resources discussions actually progressing? Now on own resources, it has been accepted that we need an interinstitutional agreement that would set up a very specific uh, time frame for specific commitments in terms of own resources. This is something that has been requested by the parliament, has also been mentioned in the council conclusions. So we are negotiating this at the moment where putting the finishing touches on this and we hope that this will not be blocked. We hope that we will be able to reach this interinstitutional agreement uh, that we will hopefully be able to adopt in plenary uh, with the MFF as well as the recovery fund. But of course we need to make progress on rule of law as well. So th both of these uh, characteristics are very important and uh, we need a majority in parliament, for, there is a majority in parliament for this. We need this package, so to speak, to make things work. It's not possible to make a realistic progress without a real commitment on own resources, where everyone is playing their part up until 2026, which is when we will start reimbursing the joint debt. So we need a very clear time frame in terms of own resources to see how we will fund the recovery so that we will not have an additional pressure on national budgets. National budgets are already at breaking point uh, and we don't want to nonetheless affect uh, the budgetary future either, that is the MFF. The only real solution to reimburse uh, the joint debt is on resources. So either we ask member states to make additional contributions to the EU budget, which is going to be very difficult in a situation of crisis, or we have a greater ambition within the MFF, but that will not be possible either, because if uh, Europe needs to work, it needs a minimum amount of funding. And the third option, therefore, is to introduce uh, new own resources without... Uh, uh, asking European citizens to up their contribution and therefore we have asked for a very specific time frame on this front. Thank you very much.